Chapter 44 Gabriel to War Gabe's last sense to go was his hearing. He waited for the sound of his own sword cutting through the air and slicing open his chest. Everything was black, his mind spinning, his body succumbing to the pressure. In the last moments of consciousness, Gabe thought he heard footsteps, feet shuffling across the concrete. Bachman still stood over him. Gabe was sure, or else the pressure would have lost some of its crushing force. Then there was a sound Gabe couldn't place, or maybe it was the ringing in his ears. He thought he heard several small explosions. The pressure disappeared. Gabe's lungs expanded as he gulped fresh air. His vision returned as he sucked in another breath, his body fighting to recover from the oxygen deprivation. He caught sight of Bachman, still standing within reach. Bachman's body jerked violently, his hands up, protecting his face. Something impaled Bachman's hand, and he dropped Gabe's sword to the ground. Gabe reached for his sword and wrapped his fingers around the hilt. At the same moment, Bachman let out a piercing yell of frustration and stumbled backward, his foot landing on the blade of the sword. Gabe's fingers were crushed as Bachman's foot pinned the sword to the concrete floor. Bachman stumbled again, his face flashing through the dim light coming through the window. One of Bachman's eyes was pierced with something that had a small circular end. Clear and brown liquid flowed down Bachman's face from the demolished eye socket. Bachman's suit was riddled with similar punctures. Something pierced the side of Bachman's skull as he looked down at Gabe. The thing sticking out of Bachman's head was a nail. Bachman let out an inhuman roar. The air whizzed with noise as nails continued to slam into Bachman's torso, arms, and head. Gabe stayed on his back pulling his hand free as Bachman's weight lifted off the sword. Bachman turned, several nails burying themselves into his back, and ran out of the warehouse through the gaping hole Gabe had created earlier. Gabe lifted his sword off the ground and pulled it toward him. He had only made it up to one knee when he heard footsteps approaching from the opposite direction. He whipped his sword in front of him, the point touching the chest of an old man. Fedora hat pulled down low over his face, long, heavy trench coat sagging from his shoulders. Vox, come on. Vox grabbed Gabe's arm and helped pull him to his feet. That will only keep him busy for a minute. Gabe let Vox pull him toward the interior wall. Gabe grabbed his second sword as they made their way across the floor. They reached the wall and crouched behind it. What was that? Gabe asked. Vox held up a framer's nail gun. I personally modified a powder-actuated nail gun. This baby can shoot seven nails a second and can hit a target from over 30 yards away. Vox patted the gun tenderly. Thank you. The sentiment felt empty, but he couldn't think of anything else to say to the brother that had saved his life. It's good to see you. Vox smiled, the leathery skin of his face lining with deep wrinkles. I told you I'd be the one to save you someday. Just didn't think it would take me 40 years to do it. Gabe set a hand on Vox's shoulder. His younger brother had aged decades beyond him. It was sobering. He'd been given the gift of youth but his brother would always be his hero. They both leaned to the side so they could peer around the wall. A blinding pain shot from Gabe's side, and he looked down to see a black shard of hematite protruding from his ribcage. Vox reached into his heavy trench coat and pulled out a pair of dirty pliers. Vox lifted Gabe's elbow and grabbed the end of the shard between the teeth of the pliers. He gave a sudden, sharp jerk, pulling the shard free. He held the hematite up, pinched in the pliers' grip. Gabe felt a wave of dizziness, as if every ounce of energy he possessed had just been pulled from his body. What else have you got in that coat? Gabe asked. A little surprise for our friend. Footsteps echoed, crushing the rubble from the building's destruction. The pattern was a step, drag like one leg was dragging from an injury. Gabe tightened his grip on his double-edged swords. Vox reached into the recesses of his overcoat. This was not a battle for an ordinary. I'm grateful for what you did, but this isn't your fight. You've done enough. They made eye contact. His brother's stubbornness in youth had stayed with him all these years. Gabe listened for the telltale sign of Bachman's breathing. The footsteps stopped. He pulled both his swords next to his body and stood. He swung around the corner weaved around the anticipated rain of hematite shards, and jammed one end of his sword into the concrete. He used the handle to propel himself into the air and twist sideways. With his other sword, he aimed for the pulsing jugular on Bachman's neck. Bachman bent backward. Gabe's sword missed again, his body continuing forward over the top of Bachman's head. Gabe twisted in the air, bringing his feet under him. Bachman turned to face him. 
You get chances to redeem yourself, to taste revenge, but you keep falling short, Bachman said. It's time to give up. Gabe clenched his jaw. He no longer cared if he lived or died. He just wanted one shot. Glass shattered, followed by a splash of liquid. Bachman's entire body burst into flame. In the flickering light, Gabe could make out Box standing beside the wall, wearing a satisfied smile. The remains of the shattered body at Bachman's feet smelled of gas. Box had broken a bottle filled with gasoline over Bachman's head and ignited it in a single swipe. Gabe was impressed. Bachman batted at his chest and arms. The gasoline-soaked fabric of his suit was being consumed, and Bachman's attempt to put out the fire were useless. Gabe felt a tug of dread as Bachman stood calmly amid the flames. There was a sudden change in pressure. His ears popped. Air rushed past him. The flames disappeared as quickly as they had ignited. Bachman stood in front of Gabe, his body still smoking. Glowing red spots remained from the fire. A bone-chilling laugh emanated from Bachman's smoldering form. The pathetic use of ordinary knowledge. We have the knowledge of creation itself, and you think you can stop me with fire? Bachman turned, moving faster than Gabe could track. He was by Vox before Gabe could let out a warning. Bachman grabbed Vox by the neck and threw him across the room. Gabe moved fast enough to catch Vox's coat and stop him before he smashed into the far wall. Vox's breath came in ragged gasps. Gabe felt a warm trickle of blood run over his hand from Vox's neck. He isn't your average demon-possessed soul, is he? Vox said. Bachman had an energy Gabe had never seen before, a knowledge of controlling things that only descendants had access to. When fighting possessed, the goal was to destroy the body, and the demon would have to move on. Find a new soul to feast on. Bachman wasn't following that generalization. The body he possessed was beyond ruined, but the demon remained, more powerful than ever. Bachman took a step forward, and a small amount of light from the night sky illuminated his disfigured face. His missing eye still drained fluid that ran down his now red and blistered face. His suit was melted in places, burned away, revealing burnt flesh. Bachman smiled, revealing blackened teeth through half-melted lips. No. He's not. Gabe felt like he should have an explanation, but his mind was blank, the cold dread of death freezing his heart. Bachman lifted his hand. Gabe prepared for the agonizing pressure that would follow. He accepted the futility of the fight. He stood tall, looking the possessed in his one good eye. Instead of being hit with a force, Vox was ripped from his hands, the frail form of his brother flying across the room, slamming into a column with a sickening crunch. 